Um, hello and welcome to episode 7 of the Cinema 4D Basics Tutorials, which I'll be guiding you through the very basics of Cinema 4D. Um, in this episode, we're going to be doing um, an, introdu an introduction to realistic lighting, which is... Um, HDRI lighting, we're going to be covering HDRI spheres, um, how to use the camera, and how to optimize your render settings for your particular hardware. So, you know, um, the, the default Cinema 4D settings are kind of overkill. So I'm going to be showing you how to get around that and kind of reduce them a little bit to something a little bit more sane, um, because we're not all running Pixar rigs. So firstly, I will be showing you how to set up your HDRI sphere, which is pretty simple, but we're just gonna go through it right now. Um, so first things first, what we really wanna do is we'll set up a, you can kind of do it with with an, an actual literal sphere, or as I prefer to do it with the sky object, which can be found in one of these menus here. Um, there you go, look in this one here. So that's the um, the, defaults to the floor object, but you can have it here as a sky object. And as we can see, our scenes change now. We have a, a sky object, but there's no texture applied. So the next thing we need to do is create um, just a default material. As always, we're using the physical renderer. In other renderers, this may differ, but for now, we're just using this. So um, we want to turn off the color channel, the reflectance channel, which are checked by default, and activate the luminance channel. Now, what I like to do I like to go along here to the end, and this allows me to activate the finder. Um, you'd have to uh, excuse these. These are from a previous project I was working on this evening. So now we're going to go into my HDRI files, and uh, let me just run these as a list. Uh, HDRIs, and hang on, columns. I prefer columns. Okay. So here are a few uh, HDRI packs I downloaded from Grayscale Gorilla. Um, I don't use any of Grayseal Gorilla's uh, plugins anymore. I just keep the HDRI packs on file. Um, a, because they started charging a subscription fee, which I didn't quite agree with. And also, I kind of kind of learned how to do it all myself anyway. So there was no point. Um, so I'm going to go with my usual uh, go-to HDRI, which is the Modern Industrial 009. You can... Get these from Grayscale Gorilla, or if you want to just Google free HDRI uh, uh, XDR files, or e sorry, EXOR files, um, you can literally just download them for free on the internet, which is pretty awesome. Um, I'm not going to share these with you because I think that'll probably be illegal. Uh, but one of these is my modern industrial 00. Which one is it? Uh, not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Hang on a second. This is the reason we had column view activated. Um, icons even. Here we go. 008. And I always use the small one here um, because it's 1750 by 875. Uh, you don't really need the full resolution of 7000 by 3500 unless you're doing some really high res stuff, which I'm not. So I'm just going to uh, select that one. And here the image is not in search path. I tend to not create a copy at the project location. You can if you like. Um, if I don't create a copy of the project location, sometimes it can kind of cause some weird behavior in Cinema 4D, which I am, I'm just happy to put up with, and I'll just put it in the project location if I need to and create a new material, um, a new default kind of material tag. Um, it's kind of hard to explain. Obviously, Cinema 4D is not perfect. It's always one of the more stable 3D packages you can find out there. It's uh, still got its quirks, which I have found out to my frustration. So cool. I'm not going to bother creating a copy of this texture file at the in my my local folder. So I'm going to click note on that one. That's just going to drag it straight across. As you can see, the file path here straight across from my operating system, which is fine by me. And now the next thing we're going to do. I'm not going to apply it straight to the sky object. I'm going to give it a name because it's good practice to give your material files a name. So we're gonna call this HDRI, and we're gonna maybe just call it one, just cause you know, you might have a few there in your materials library and want, might wanna flick between them just to test it. Call it that. And another thing that I always do, which is a kind of a, a top tip, is I will normally 
instead of just using the HDRI file as it comes, you can, you can actually change this, you can adjust it. So if I click on this downward arrow and go to, where are we, where are we? Yeah, there is, a, there should be an option for filter, filter, here we go. So now, if I've changed that to filter, I can click on the little thumbnail here, and it gives me all sorts of options. So I can, I can do all sorts of wacky stuff with this HDRI file. I can change the saturation. It gives me loads more options if I just drag and dropped it. So lightness, all of that option is available. And what I normally do if my scenes are looking a little bit too green or too yellow, because obviously the HDRI file will be reflected in them, I will turn the saturation down to maybe minus 35-ish, maybe minus 30-ish. And what that does, as you can see, it kind of just obviously desaturates the images. If you're familiar with Photoshop, you'll know what that means. If you're not familiar with Photoshop, it just means it kind of makes it a little more, bit more black and white. It washes the colors out. And so basically it's not interfering with the colors you've chosen to be in the scene and you're getting your reflections. So we're gonna start off here with our HDRI and we're gonna drag it across over to the sky object. And so now we can see our scene has kind of become a bit more brighter, but to really kind of see what we're doing, we need to add some objects to the scene. Um, first things first, I'm probably just gonna set up a floor and a background first. So um, I don't tend to use the actual floor because that's an infinite floor. And with global illumination, which we'll be covering shortly, um, that's... I'll, I'll do it within the render settings optimization. Um, that kind of, that's an infinite floor. And it, with global illumination, it kind of increases your render time a lot. Um, so what I tend to do is just use a plane and then I can just kind of cut it with the camera crop uh, and do what I need to do, which is, uh, which is groovy. So I'm just gonna hit F5 to get my orthogonal views active. And if I zoom out, I can see here the edges of my plane. Um, they're not obviously visible here. I want to keep that in the center there. I'll, uh, I'm not going to use my keyboard shortcuts because I'm re leaning my head on my, my hand, so I'm not going to be lazy. Uh, it's been a long day. Uh, so here we go. We have a plane. And we probably want to add a background to this as well. So, um, I mean, you can use the background object. Um, again, I, I tend to just kind of treat it like, like as if I was setting up a scene for, for the stage with a, with a real-life camera. And, and uh, you know, and stuff like that. So I, I tend to just, I'm, I'm kind of old school in that in that way of my thinking. So I'm just gonna use uh, just another plane. And we'll hit the, whatever makes that go up the way. There you go. Um, and so we'll, we'll have that there. And I put, and now I'm gonna add an actual object that we can reflect light of, which, which will be the sphere. And I'm gonna hit O on the keyboard just to zoom in. I can see my plane. I can see my sphere. So I can see straight away I'm gonna to need to make that plane bigger, but I'm gonna reduce the width and height segments just because it's good practice to minimize your unnecessary geometry. Now, um, I'm not gonna use the grab handles, I'm just gonna use the scale tool because I can scale it uniformly. And I'm gonna hit my sphere, lift that up, and here we go. Um, let me just see where my background went because you know that's kind of an important part of the scene so that, um, oh yeah, there we go. So hit these buttons until you get what you want. Ah, there you go. We'll move that back. So now, oops, wrong view. Um, where are we at? Where are we at? Uh, okay. So I want to be moving it back that way. And this plane here is that one. So now we, we just have our, I've mixed those up, but it, it really doesn't matter as long as you get what you want in the end. There are no kind of hard and fast reels. You just kind of need to find your own way of doing it. And my way of doing it is kind of trial and error. And I have no real fixed formula for doing this kind of deal. Um, what I really do like to do, though, is, is kind of experiment and, and kind of just play with different lighting rigs and stuff like that. Um, so if we've got one here. And um, the next thing we're going to have to do is activate our global illumination. Um, it's already checked here in the in the render settings. Um, so if I delete my my uh, default render, well I won't delete it, but um, I'll leave it there. So this is my render setting. This is the default render setting. Okay, uh, what you can see here. So if we go into the view and if I hit com uh, sorry not command uh, option or to activate render preview, you can see here now 
There's hardly any reflection on this. It looks pretty, it looks pretty flat. And yet yeah, it's not the kind of thing that you really want to present to a client. So um, we hit our render settings. First thing we want to do is, let's have a look. Okay, we're in our standard renderer. We want to change that to the physical straight away. And then we hit our effects button, global illumination. And I like to add some ambient occlusion as well. Uh, what I normally do, I think this ambient occlusion is a bit harsh. I normally just uh, hit the gradient just here where you see the ghost little uh, notch kind of appear there. Uh, I'll delete this one and have my ambient occlusion and kind of a little bit less kind of dark. That's just my personal style. It's up to you. You could have it in pink if you like. You can change these colors around and, and do what you like. Uh, personally, I don't do that because it kind of looks weird unless it's kind of like a really red scene or, or whatever. But yeah, the, the options there to do what you want. And um, then obviously your global illumination here. Uh, I tend to use the legacy version of a radiance cache because I've found some weird kind of uh, shadowing on the on the later versions. Um, that's just me though. It could be my setup. It could be my lack of knowledge. Um, I'm just sharing what I know. So, you know, feel free to correct me. Um, so the secondary method, I normally use QMC, Quasi Monte Carlo. That's a brute force renderer. I don't use it as a primary method because it does take a long time. The secondary method is less prioritized by the software. So it's kind of, um, it's a nice to have, but you know, I, I prefer, because I tend to re-render scenes a lot. So if they're cached, obviously that's in the, in the name of Radiance Cache, it does speed it up a little bit more. Um, I'll, I'm on a M1 Pro Apple Mac, so the medium's okay. If you're on like a GTX 4090 on a PC rig, you could probably go as the high details level. For the stuff I do, it's mainly digital and for the web, so I tend not to need that. But if I was doing really crazy stuff, then maybe I'd, I'd select the higher settings. But for what I've got to do for my day-to-day -day routine, this is absolutely fine. Um, so Radiance Cache Legacy and QMC as a secondary method. That's my personal preference. Um, I used to use light mapping when I was on uh, an old uh, i7 Mac, and that was that was pretty good. I didn't quite have the grunt to run QMC, but um, you know it's up to you. You optimize as you need to go. So we'll we'll jump back into the viewport now and see how we're getting on you see instantly straight away if you rewind before to the ref before we changed the uh, global global illumination and ambient occlusion settings they it was very flat now we've got a little bit more of a 3d view and obviously we can see the hdri sky here uh, if i was to create say uh, a shiny material and apply it to the sphere um, let's just go, okay, reflectance. You can add the color channel. Another way of addressing the color channel is to add a lambrician to the uh, reflectance channel and that'll give you kind of color, but it tends to be, because it's a diffuse layer, it tends to be kind of rough, um, but you can get away with it in certain instances. Um, I tend to use the color channel personally and just use the reflectance channel for reflections, but it is an option. If you want it to be an option, it's there. Um, so let's hit uh, GGX. Uh, obviously, GGX has kind of made a like a metallic-looking sphere, which is if that's what you want, that's fine, you know. Uh, what I tend to do is add a layer Fresnel. Uh, Fresnel is a kind of like um, it's a little bit like diffusion, but it's more kind of um, oh, it's let me just let me just show you, let me just show you dielectric. And that's a type of Fresnel. So we can see we've got the waxy, glossy reflectance effect on the sphere, but it doesn't look like it's made out of chrome. Uh, obviously, the conductor one's a little bit more chromey, so you can you can just choose between those as you see fit. Uh, I tend to go for this one just because that's kind of like the, the, the work I'm doing. Um, but, you know, do what you like. There's no rules. Find your own way. Um, so here we go. Um, so this is we've we've set everything up now. So we've got a decent enough looking render, relatively. And uh, however, you might find your 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 computer's taking a long time to render this stuff. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let me just add a just just to put this into context. What I'll do is I will add a sphere that happens to have a transparency channel. Which, uh, which would be this one. Let's move this in here. And let's 
Okay, so we'll get rid of you, get rid of you, add a transparency channel. We'll add actually the default index of refraction. An index of refraction is just how much a material bends light. Uh, so glass bends it. So one is kind of like no bending. So let's just hit one. See, it's disappeared. Actually, if I apply that to the sphere, it might make more sense. See, it's just literally see-through. There's no light bending involved at all. If I go we go back to glass, 1.5, it'll bend it 1.5 times. So you can see there's kind of like the HDRI is becoming reflected in the glass. It doesn't look too cool, but, you know, it's doing the job. Um, so what I'll do is I'll stick a sphere here. I'll stick another sphere inside that. I'll scale it down so you can kind of see a sphere inside a sphere, and it'll give you an idea of how it's reflecting the light. So... The next thing we want to do, actually, that doesn't look too bad compared to what it looked like before. So, you know, it's all good. And in the render settings, we have options. Many, many options. Um, I normally set my reflection depth to five. I think the default is all of these 15. And if we look, I'm not going to let it do it too much, but you can see the, the actual render slows down quite a lot because it's it's kind of like rendering your shadows, reflections, and refractions to like a level of 15, which is it's pretty ludicrous, if I'm honest. Um, I mean, five is a good level to set them to preview at, and um, I mean you can you can get away with a final render at five if it looks all right. I mean, sometimes I'll actually reduce the reflect the refraction depth because it doesn't look right, and maybe like a, a depth of say ten looks a bit not great, and a, and a level of eight can actually change it so that you know if you get weird things happening at the edges of your model and stuff like that, you know you can you can just kind of play around with it, um, and also. Here's a cool little trick you can do. In your Alt or Render Preview, you get this little um, arrow thing at the side. And so if you drag that up and down, it'll increase and decrease the quality of your preview, which obviously reduces render time accordingly. So here we have, you know, we've got to wait for a little while for it to render. And if we just grab this and drag it down, you know, you can kind of get a more of an instant result. And it is obviously a lot more pixelated because it's rendering a lot of data, but, you know, if you just need to kind of have a rough idea what it's going to look like, you know, Bob's your uncle. Um, so what else is on the list for tonight? Uh, HDR lighting, um, camera. So the render settings optimization, that's pretty much it really for render settings optimization. I'll show you the camera in a sec. We'll add some depth of field as well to make it look cool because that's the whole point of my life, make it look cool. Um, so... Yeah, we've, we've decreased our options here to a more appropriate level for the hardware. Um, obviously, the physical, you have different uh, settings that you can have for your physical too. You have, obviously, your fixed, and then you have your various options here. Uh, adaptive is another one. I tend to go with adaptive medium. That's my general setting. Um, so my Ollie optimized here is... Um, Okay, we're adapted because I was out. That's an old setting, but I normally that my new my new one is is um, medium, but that was for, like my old settings from my old computer, and this is um, you know, so I still need to update a few little bits and bobs here and there. But yeah, so uh, five for shading error threshold of five percent is pretty good. Um, if you're getting a lot of noise, you can lower this, and if you increase it, you'll get more noise. Depends if you get if you have like a floor that's reflecting stuff, you can um. You can have trouble with that. Um, you can, your shading error threshold will, will sort it out for you, but at a cost of render time. Uh, so it's all about kind of balancing it. You know, there's lots of options here that you can balance it with. Um, and obviously you want to just select what's best for you. Uh, and so obviously this is my optimized render setting here. And um, yeah, you know, so we've got, obviously this is the ambient occlusion. So if I, if I was to um, if I was turn ambient occlusion off, we might not get those shadows at the bottom. Although well, we might, the global illumination can handle them, but you can see obviously there, they're not as apparent and they don't quite look as close to the floor as they would if we turned ambient occlusion back on. Um, you can play around with the minimum and the maximum ray length of these. So if I was to set this to like a thousand, uh, the same as the maximum, you'd get a different kind of effect. Um, you might not on this exact scene, but if you had lots of little details and stuff, you you know you could you, you'd start to notice differences. So it's just something to be aware of and something that you can obviously help you harness the power of Cinema 4D. Um, it's hard to actually compare them directly because when they're rendering, it takes a little time for them to render. Um, but you know it it can be a bit tricky. So let's see if it makes a difference now. Have you? Yeah, you can see obviously yeah that's that's, that's gone completely. Um, so. Sorry if I blew the mic out just then. Um, 
And so yeah, um, I must have hit undo at some point. But you know, if I if I did this, I can make it a little bit darker. Maybe you know, go with twenty thirty percent. Um, you see here, yeah, we've got shadows again. Um, and so yeah, um. The render settings optimization is that's, that pretty much covers it really in, in context of what I want to teach you and the kind of the, the, the basics. Um, that's pretty much it really. I mean, this is obviously the physical renderer, um, Arnold, V-Ray, etc. You're gonna have to learn them from someone else. Uh, but if you just download a cinema for you and you're learning it, um, and you just want to get started with the physical renderer because it's built in, um, loads of people still use it, and it's a really, really good renderer. That's, that's what you need. Um, so the next thing we're gonna cover is a camera. And so we're using the physical renderer and the beauty of the physical renderer, among other things, is that it gives you access to the function of depth of field, like you have a real camera. So we need to hit our physical option here in the options and we hit our depth of field. Obviously motion blur is obviously available there as an option as well, but if you're not doing animation, um, you tend to leave it unchecked, but I tend to use it. If I'm, if I'm doing an illustration with movement in it, it just needs to be a still. I can still utilize the motion blur, but I tend not to. For instance, if I am, you know, emptying a pot of gummies and I want it to look like it's being emptied, I can tell Cinema 4D to calculate that motion blur, which is awesome. But for now, we'll just cover depth of field. So here is our camera right up here. And so we need to go orthographic view to find out where that camera's pointing. We'll just hit command or to disable this view here, or the, the, the active preview. And we can see our camera's overshooting our objects by a little bit. So that will create a blurry scene. Um, let's just, we, this turns the camera on and off. It kind of, it kind of it, well, it puts you into camera mode. So if I come out of here, right, so I'm over here, right? Um, okay. Uh, no, I don't want to scale the camera. That was my bad. Let's go here. Okay. So you see I've come out of the camera. Now I'm in the camera. I'm out of the camera. I'm in the camera. So you can see the view changes. So I can just uncheck that and go navigate my scene all I like. You know, if there's something wrong with the model, I can go in and fiddle around with it and fix it. Oh, look, there's some geometry. Um, uh, okay, that's fixed, you know, hypothetically. And instead of going back to try to find out where I was, I can just hit that button, boom. And another handy thing for the camera is that you can lock the camera. That would be under rigging tags and that would be under the protection tag. So now, no matter what I do, I cannot move that camera. You might be able to hear the mouse scratching on the desk, but I can't move the camera because I've got a protection tag on it. Um, and that's what we want. Because obviously once you've got your angle set up, you, you wanna keep it nice. Um, you can still change the focus of the camera um, and how you change the depth of field is like a real camera. You you change the aperture. So the lower the aperture, the, the wider the aperture. And so an aperture of eight's kind of uh, pretty narrow. So if we go for like, you can go down to like 0 0.1. And obviously in your display, I didn't want to save that. Uh, in your display options here, you can activate depth of field and it will show you, you can see how this has gone blurry here. Uh, it'll give you a little bit of a preview. And then when you hit render, uh, you obviously, when you're on a very low setting on the render preview, it's you can't ascertain depth of field because it's too pixelated. So you have to turn that up to be able to see it. And you can see here now we have our spheres with our transparencies and stuff, and they are looking pretty groovy with their depth of field, look just like a real camera. And um, I think that pretty much wraps it up for this tutorial because that was all I had planned. Um, yeah, let's have a look. Oh, do I have anything else? Okay, let me just check my list. Uh, setup sphere, done that. Form background, sky material, luminous channel, add objects to the scene via transparent object, featuring a transparent object, done that. Depth of field, global illumination, optimized render settings. Um, also, one thing to consider as well, I may have mentioned in a previous tutorial, is that you can add a regular light as well as your HDRI if you want. Um, so where are we gonna go with our lights? Here we go. So we just, what I normally do is I set up a target light because it saves a lot of hassle. Because when you have a normal light, it just points anywhere. So I'll just set my target light up straight away. Like I said before, they're all kind of the same. Uh, they're, just, they're just different set, they're just, they're just presets. You know, you can do this all manually, obviously, but these are just presets. And I drag one of these spheres in as my light target. And then I'm gonna move my light around, safe in the knowledge that my light will be pointing at 
one of these objects. Uh, hang on a minute, where's my light? Okay, I need to just make sure that's groovy. Yeah, see? So the preview has given me this kind of shadow here. And, you know, what we want to do is just move that back a bit. Now if I hit, also as well, just another little pointer. Um, Obviously, the bigger, the more render, the, the bigger size of the render area, the longer it takes. So, if you're rendering in this view with 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 Option Or, it's going to take longer than. I mean, this is obviously going to take longer than if it was rendering in this smaller view. Sometimes this is all you need, and you just want to do that. But um, just to let you know, um, so you can see how the light's affecting this ball now. Uh, we can see it's kind of creating the shadow here. Uh, I haven't told the light to cast any shadows yet. So inside the light object you will find the menu and hit shadow and we go for shadow map soft ray trace hard or area shadows um, shadow map soft is pretty cool we can increase the resolution of the shadows here and um, when it renders you'll see hopefully some shadows there you go there are some shadows uh, do with them as you will but that's how it works guys um, so if you enjoyed this video uh, please feel free to like and subscribe if not then feel free to leave a dislike and and a, and a comment saying ollie you're you're an idiot um I'll, you know, I'll take on the channel big boy um and if you want to get notified the next time i make a tutorial and um, hit the bell icon and other than that i wish you all the best on your 3d journey uh namaste and all the best good luck to you guys out there and uh, i'll see you for the next tutorial at some point when i when i feel like doing it bye